Well, good morning and happy Easter, North Peace Church family. He is risen, and that's where you would say he is risen indeed. Um, we want to spend some time in the Word this morning, but just a, a couple of quick announcements to make you aware of, of, of our services coming up in the future. Um, many of you maybe already saw the Facebook video that we put out, but um, we're going to be continuing to have outdoor services moving forward. So next Sunday, April 11th, we're going to have two outdoor services uh, at 9.30 and 11.30, and you'll have to register for those. And then we'll also have our, our regular um, live stream at the normal time that it usually is, 9.45 on Facebook and YouTube and our website as well. Um, also, this next Sunday, April 11th, um, Kid Zone is going to be starting up on Sunday mornings. Uh, for both of those service times, 9.30 and 11.30. And so you'll have to register your kids for that as well. And it'll, it'll be very similar to how we were doing it before when you would drop your kids off at that basement entrance, uh, the, the side of the building facing Finch Elementary, and then you would pick them up afterwards as well. So um, uh, registrations for both the services and Kids Zone will open up on Tuesday morning. And if you have any questions, you can always ask uh, one of the church staff, and we'd love to help you out. So we want to spend some time in the Word this morning, specifically um, celebrating and remembering the resurrection of Jesus. I know many of you were here with us in the back parking lot on Good Friday, or maybe you watched online the Good Friday message. And so Good Friday is, is the day where we specifically remember the death of Jesus. But without Easter Sunday, um, Good Friday really means nothing. Um, like the Apostle Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And so we, we, two days ago, celebrated Good Friday and the death of Jesus for our sins. But the reality is without Easter morning, without the resurrection, well, then all of that remembering would have been in vain. Good Friday would have meant nothing. But, but here is what is so amazing. And here's what we're celebrating and remembering and focusing on today. The fact that Jesus did rise from the dead. Jesus did not stay dead. He was in the tomb for three days and then he walked out of the tomb and he proved that he is who he says he is. He proved that the payment for our sins was accepted. Uh, the fact that Jesus um, walked out of the grave proved that, that Good Friday meant something. And so today, um, if you're a follower of Jesus, today is a day of much celebration. Um, like I said on Good Friday, our whole theme for this kind of Easter season um, with, with Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter Sunday, our whole theme has been until he comes. And on Good Friday, if, if you missed uh, the message, we, we looked at the, the many, many prophecies in the Old Testament that, that point forward to the death of the Messiah. Um, prophecies in the Old Testament that described and like in very great detail the trial and the death of Jesus. And the amazing thing is that these prophecies, these glimpses, these kind of uh, uh, pointing forward to this event that would happen, th they took place like thousands of years even before Jesus came and Jesus fulfilled all of them. And so all along there was this longing, even from, from Genesis 3 moving forward, there was this longing in people that one day there was going to be a Messiah. One day a Savior, a King was going to come. Now here's what's interesting about the resurrection. Um, Paul says that the resurrection took place according to to the scriptures. So in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, um, he writes this For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, right? We looked at that on Good Friday, that Christ's death was in accordance 
with scriptures. And then it says that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So what's interesting is Paul says not only was the death of Jesus prophesied and and according to the scriptures it happened, but Paul says also the resurrection of Jesus was prophesied and it took place according to the scriptures. So the question then is, was the resurrection of Jesus really prophesied before it happened? And the answer is yes, in in a couple of different places and in a couple of different ways. So uh, I'll, I'll point out a few of them. Psalm 16, verse 10, um, David writes this. And keep in mind, this is, you know, 900, 1,000 years before Jesus came, somewhere in that area. But Psalm 16, 10 says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. So David is saying, God, God you're not going to abandon my soul to the grave. That's what Sheol means, right? My, I'm not going to go to the grave and you're not going to abandon me there. And then he says, you won't let your Holy One see corruption. And the title, Holy One, is a unique messianic title. David's not talking about himself here. Nowhere in the Old Testament is that title, Holy One, given to anyone besides the Messiah. And so it's this unique title and so what David is talking about is this Messiah God's not going to let his holy one see corruption see decay in the grave and so in Psalm 16 you get I mean it's it's almost like it's cloaked a little bit but you get this hint at the resurrection of Jesus God will not abandon Jesus to the grave and he's not going to let his holy one see corruption and decay meaning that God is going to raise him from the dead even in Isaiah 53 uh, another example verse 10 yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt he shall see his offspring he shall prolong his days The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So Isaiah, and we talked a little bit about this on Good Friday, Isaiah talks about the Messiah being crushed and put to grief, and his soul is making an offering for guilt. That's talking about Jesus' death. But then Isaiah says, he, the Messiah, Jesus, will see his offspring, and he'll prolong his days. And so you go, well, wait a second. If the Messiah is, is crushed and put to grief, how is he going to see his 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 offspring and prolong his days? And so again, it's this kind of cloaked, reference to the resurrection and even the word prolong where where Isaiah says he shall prolong his days the word prolong is is sometimes used to refer to an everlasting afterlife it doesn't just mean that God will you know give him five ten years the word prolong can mean that uh, um, it means forever right e- eternity that Jesus was raised to new life forever even in the book of Hosea, Hosea 6, it says this, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. And you kind of go, that's an odd expression in the book of Hosea because Hosea is talking about Israel and Judah being restored. But you go, well, wait a second. Why, why is that language used? And I'll tell you, it's not coincidence that Hosea says, right, on the third day, he will raise us up and that Jesus was raised up on the third day. It's a foreshadow of the resurrection of Jesus. Even if you think of um, the book of Jonah, right? Jonah was in uh, the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, and Jesus even makes reference to that, right? The only sign that you're going to see is the sign of Jonah. And so he's saying, right, that, that experience that Jonah went, to, went through, that was meant to be this foreshadow and this pointer to the fact that Jesus was going to be in a grave for three days and then raised to new life. 
So I tell you all that to just show you yet again, right? We talked about this on Good Friday. The, the death of Jesus was not just circumstance or, um, you know, really bad timing on Jesus' part. The, the death of Jesus was according to the foreknowledge and the providential plan of God since the beginning. And I would say the resurrection of Jesus as well. It wasn't an afterthought. The resurrection of Jesus wasn't a plan B. It's not as if Jesus died and God went, well, that can't be the end, okay? Um, we'll have to raise him from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus was according to the definitive plan of God since the beginning. Like this was all prophesied thousands of years before it happened, that the Messiah would live and that he would die and that he would be raised from the dead. So there is so much um, richness in the account of the resurrection and so many different you know, avenues we could go down or things that we could look at in the text about the resurrection of Jesus. And we've done that in past years here at North Peace. We've talked about the validity of the resurrection, how we can actually believe that it, that it actually happened according to eyewitnesses and historical events that actually prove that the resurrection is true. We could talk about the um, theological significance about what the resurrection means for us, right? As, as Jesus is the first uh, resurrection from the dead to, to new life forever, and that kind of foreshadows the fact that you and I will be resurrected when Jesus returns. We could talk about that, and we have in the past. We, uh, we could talk about, right, what the new heavens and the new earth is going to look like because Jesus was raised from the dead. But this morning, today, I want to focus on something I find really interesting, so think about, think about the, the timeline that we've been kind of talking about. People for thousands of years were longing and waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And then Jesus came and he lived a perfect life and he was obedient to the Father and he willingly went to the cross to die for mankind. And then Jesus was buried and three days later he rose from the dead and then we read about his interactions with the disciples. We read that um, if you were at the service. And so uh, we, you can read it in John chapter 20 and 21, all of these interactions with his disciples and he appears physically to them and they, they touch his body and he eats with them, like all of these amazing things. And then in Acts 1, we're told that Jesus speaks to his disciples before he's going to ascend into heaven. So in Acts 1, starting in verse 6, it says this, when they had come together, so this is Jesus' disciples with him, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So like I said, here's what I find so fascinating about this. Jesus is raised from the dead miraculously and he meets with his disciples and he gives them this charge. He says, I want you to be my witnesses. And then he ascends into heaven. He, he leaves them. And as the disciples are staring and they're, they're watching this happen, we're told that two angels tell them, why, why, are you, why are you looking? The same way that Jesus left, he'll come back to you, right? This Jesus who was taken into heaven, uh, he's going to come back in the same way. So think about that. Just like how followers of God in the Old Testament were waiting 
and longing and they wanted the Messiah to come, this Savior, this King in the same way now followers of Jesus for the last 2,000 years we've been waiting and longing for Jesus to return. So think about that. Both in the Old Testament, in this Old Covenant, they were waiting and longing Jesus, the Messiah. We want the Messiah to come. And now in this New Covenant, we're doing the same thing, right? Our salvation has been taken care of and new life, and yet we still have that same kind, same kind of longing and waiting for Jesus to come again. Because even Jesus promised his disciples he was going to go away but that he would return. John 14, Jesus says this to his, his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I'll take you to myself that where I am, you may be also, so Jesus even early on told his disciples, like, I'm going to be leaving soon. I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare things for you. But he promised, I'm going to come again and, and I'll, I'll take you to myself so that we'll be together always. Even, even think about the Last Supper, right? And we, we read this on Good Friday. Uh, Jesus eats the, the Last Supper with his disciples and he says right as they drink the the wine he says this is the the blood of the new covenant i won't drink this with you again until we do so in my father's kingdom so jesus even hinted there like this is the last time we're going to drink this together in person but there's coming a day when we'll we'll celebrate this meal in my father's kingdom again see jesus knew all along what his mission was he came to die, he came to be raised from the dead, and he knew that he was going to return to his Father, ascend into heaven, and he promises the disciples, I will be back, I'm coming again. I'm not going to abandon you, right? So we don't, we don't live with this kind of, well, Jesus did what he did, and now, you know, we're left here on our own. Jesus said, I, I am going to come back for you. And so now, think about that, 2,000 years later, April 4th, 2021, in Fort St. John, B.C., we are waiting for the return of Jesus, just longing for it, right? Saying, come, Lord Jesus, come soon. And so the question I want to ask and answer, hopefully, this morning is, if the resurrection is, is true, if Jesus really did... Uh, rise from the dead, if that actually happened, then what do we do in this in-between time? What do we do as we wait? Because every generation has believed that they were going to be the last ones, right? Since Jesus left, every generation looked around at their circumstances and they said, this has got to be it, right? Jesus has got to be coming soon. And yet God in his sovereignty and in his providence and in his perfect timing God has not triggered the return of Christ yet and so as we wait right with eager expectation as we wait for our risen savior Jesus to return what do you and I do right I don't think that we just kind of sit around waiting right twiddling our thumbs and going well Jesus is going to be back soon I don't think that's the answer so I have, I have three points for you this morning. Three things, I mean, there obviously could be more, but three things I think we do and pursue until Jesus comes back. The first thing is this, as we wait for the return of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, then we pursue holiness and godliness. Um, Peter talks about this in both of his letters in the New Testament. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so, what they, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, 
they may see your good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. So Peter says, you know, live as exiles, live as strangers to this world. You know, if you're a Christian, you kind of maybe you've realized, I don't really belong here. I don't fit in with the rest of the world. And so Peter says, yeah, live like that. Don't follow the passions of your flesh. Those are actually trying to kill your soul. But he says, keep your conduct among Gentiles. He means unbelievers, honorable. Not so that they look at you and go, oh, how honorable you are. No, Peter says, so that they see your good works and they glorify God on the day of visitation. That's the day of Jesus' return. In 2 Peter 3, Peter says this, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, right? That's the return of Jesus. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works done on it will be exposed since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. So Peter asks, right, the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, it's close, it's coming. So what type of people should we be as we wait? And he says, what what type of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? So I think it's so interesting that Peter says, live like exiles. Don't give in to the passions of your flesh. Keep your conduct pure. Live holy and godly lives. And holiness basically just means being set apart. Essentially, be, be different from the, what, the rest of the world around you. Don't just do what the world does. Be, be holy, be set apart. And then, and then Peter says, be godly, right? And, and I think that just points to how we obey the scriptures and we're trying through the power of the Holy Spirit to be like Jesus. And that's so key, right? Being a Christian doesn't mean that Jesus has died for you and now you're trying really, really hard in your own strength to be holy and godly. The whole point of the gospel is that we can't do it on our own, but when you surrender to Jesus, you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you're empowered by God because of what Jesus has done for you. And I, and I love that the majority of the New Testament lays out the gospel. This is what Jesus has done for you. And then how you live because the gospel is true. If you look at Paul's writings, almost all of Paul's letters have the first half, this is what Jesus has done for you. And the second half is, this is what you live like because of what Jesus has done for you. Right? That's the majority of the New Testament. How do we live if the gospel is true? And so I would say, as we are in this in-between time before Jesus returns, we pursue lives of holiness and godliness. We, we, we read God's word and we want to obey. We want to obey Jesus because, because he died and was raised from the dead. We want to be set apart so that unbelievers see the things we do and they give glory to Jesus. Secondly, so as we wait for Jesus, we pursue holiness and godliness. Secondly, as we long for and wait for the return of Jesus, we are witnesses to him. We are witnesses to the lamb who was slain. I mean, Jesus says that in Acts chapter 1. He tells his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so you think about, well, what are witnesses? Witnesses are people who testify that something has happened. Right? If you think about even a, a, a courtroom scene and, and you have the defendant and then they actually bring in witnesses. And what are witnesses? Witnesses are usually people who say, I saw something or I have information about something that pertains to this case that's going on. And so witnesses are people who testify that something actually happened. Jesus died and he was raised from the dead and then he tells his disciples, you are my witnesses. Go and tell everybody about what has happened. Um, even in Matthew 28, Jesus says a very similar thing. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make 
disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything that I've taught you. He basically says, go and be my witnesses. Go and tell people about the truth of the gospel. Tell people about what you've seen. Tell people about the cross. Tell people about what the resurrection means. And so if you read the book of Acts, you see the disciples doing just that. Bearing witness to who Jesus is. Bearing witness to what he accomplished. And what happens? I mean, the church explodes. And people believe and they repent and they're baptized. And here's what's amazing. 2,000 years later, the mission is still the same. As followers of Jesus, we have a message of hope for the world. I mean, you look at what's going on in the world and people desperately want hope and they're putting hope in the government and they're they're putting hope in their bank account and they're putting hope in a vaccine and they're putting hope in all of these different things and and the christian message is we actually have a hope not just for your circumstances not just for the things that are going on in your life but we have a hope for all eternity for you every human being on the planet deserves to hear this message of hope a message of restoration, a message of reconciliation. Your neighbors deserve to hear about this hope, right? They deserve to have you be a witness to the gospel. And so one of the ways that we respond to Easter, to the reality of the resurrection, is if Jesus really did rise from the dead, we have to tell people. We have to witness to that fact. So as we wait for the return of Jesus, we pursue godliness and holiness. And as we wait for the return of Jesus, we are witnesses to him. And lastly, as we long and wait for the return of Jesus, we willingly suffer like he did. And this is, this is one that's a little bit harder to hear. But throughout the New Testament, the apostles wrote to various people churches and essentially one of the encouragements one of the messages that is consistent throughout the new testament is an encouragement to suffer well to be willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel and if you read church history you will know that the church grows and expands and faith deepens when when the church is persecuted and pushed to the margins of society. The church usually suffers and compromises and shrinks when it actually is in a position of power. The church does best when it has nothing, when it loses everything. That's when the church actually does best. And so as we wait for Jesus, one of the things that we do is we willingly suffer for him. Um, Revelation 12, 11 even talks about this. It talks about Satan being thrown down and Satan goes after the church and he pursues the church and he persecutes them and, and it describes the saints. It says, this is, this is what it says about the saints. And they've conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they loved not their lives even unto death. Right, no, notice that. How, how does the church conquer how do christians conquer it's not by gaining positions of power the church does not conquer by electing the right people or moralizing and christianizing the 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 culture that we live in how does the church and the saints conquer they conquer by the blood of jesus by the word of their testimony, by witnessing to the fact that Jesus shed his blood, and by not loving their lives even unto death. So how do we overcome, right, in this in-between time? We overcome because Jesus spilled his blood. We overcome by witnessing to the fact that the gospel is real, and by the fact that we do not love our lives even unto death. We are willing and ready to suffer and even die for the sake of the gospel, to make much of him, to point people to Jesus. So Easter Sunday reminds us that there is actually hope. 
Um, each Easter, I, I always try and put myself, put myself in the disciples' shoes. Because on Friday, their teacher, their master, was killed. And I am sure that on Friday, all hope was lost. They didn't understand what was happening. I mean, it was over for them. Jesus came and it was so exciting and now he's dead. But on Sunday, as they went to the tomb and it was empty, and as Jesus appeared to them several times and they realized that he was alive, I mean, hope was restored. And so you and I as followers of Jesus, we live with that same hope. It's not a false hope in a fairy tale, hoping that, man, I hope that it's actually true, but it is a solid hope rooted in the reality of the resurrection, and we live with this hope and this longing for Jesus to come again, to come and make all things new, to come and usher in his kingdom in its fullness, and to come and restore the universe, to come and dwell with his people. And so in the meantime, as we wait and long and expect I mean, we get to work, right? Not to work because we have to or to earn something, but we pursue holiness and godliness in repentance in response to who Jesus is and what he's done. We pursue being witnesses to the lamb who was slain, telling the world about the hope that exists in Jesus. And then we willingly lay our lives down and we're willing to suffer as Jesus did. We love our lives even, or, or, or rather, we don't love our lives even unto death to serve our great king. And I think all of us would go, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Right? We long for the day when the sky rips open and our Savior appears. So, Jesus, I thank you that today is a day where we celebrate a real and living hope that we have. Not a false hope and a false sense of security and something that we just really wish was true, but a hope that is rooted in reality. Jesus, I thank you that you were raised from the dead. That not even the grave could hold you down. Not even death could conquer you. Not sin, not evil Jesus, that you paid the penalty for our sins and then you walked out of the grave victorious. And Jesus, you are ruling and reigning even now. And so God, I pray for your church. I pray for believers. I pray for us that as we live with this kind of eager expectation and longing for your return, that Jesus, we would pursue lives of holiness and godliness Jesus, that we would be witnesses to the reality of the gospel and that we would be willing to suffer for your name, Jesus. And so, Jesus, your bride, the church, we say, come. Come, Lord Jesus, would you return? Hasten your return, Jesus. We pray that you would come soon, that you would come in our lifetime, in our generation. Jesus, would you come? You are worthy of all of our praise. We make much of you this Easter Sunday. And so we pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So I want to thank you for joining us for our Easter message online. I pray that you've been encouraged and challenged and strengthened. Um, Just a reminder that on Tuesday, if you would like to register for one of our outdoor services or for Kids Zone, uh, check out the website or Facebook. Uh, Tuesday morning and get your spot and hopefully we'll see lots of you here. So God bless you and just spend the day celebrating the reality that Jesus is alive. God bless.